Hello class, um, welcome to our first recorded lecture of the semester. Um, today, what I want to do is give you an introduction to Sister Carrie by um, telling you a little bit about the first city that she arrives in in the novel, which is Chicago. And the novel tells us that she arrived in 1889, which is kind of an important point in um, the history of Chicago. Um, one of the significant things to understand about the United States during the late 19th century is that its position in the world was maybe a little bit like China is today, or maybe like China five, six, seven years ago, um, in the sense that the United States had previously been, you know, a less powerful country, kind of a cultural backwater, certainly much less significant compared to, say, Europe. Um, but after the Civil War, as the country began to rebuild, it becomes this place of explosive economic growth. Um, it receives a whole lot of immigrants from Europe. Um, and it becomes the space of technological um, innovation and really lays the ground for the position that the United States would have um, in the 20th century. Um, and Chicago in a lot of ways kind of epitomizes this period in uh, the 19th century, whereas um, New York and Philadelphia are, and Boston are kind of the old cities of the United States. You know, they were founded way back in the 1500s or the 1600s. Um, Chicago is in many ways brand new. So in 1889, when Chicago arrived, uh, when Carrie arrives, Chicago is on the verge of becoming the second most populous city in the United States. And New York, of course, of course is the first. In um, 1890, Chicago passes up Philadelphia to become the second most populous. Um, it's situated out on the flat open prairie of Illinois um, on the banks of Lake Michigan. Um, which is a very different kind of situation than, say, Manhattan, which is an island and which is right next to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, Chicago, like arriving in Chicago, you have to imagine traveling across like flat open farmland. It's a little like Moscow in a way, um, flat open farmland and the train are, and as the train is proceeding towards the city, you see this massive city just arise in the distance, like from, from the grass. Um, kind of a very dramatic experience um, to arrive in Chicago by train as Carrie has done. So the city was kind of a marvel and, and it gave birth to certain modern innovations, especially in architecture. So Chicago is where we see the first building to be called a skyscraper and we see various innovations in um, consumer culture, um, such as the department store. Um, in 1893, um, Chicago would be host to the World's Fair, which is also called the Columbian Exposition. And at the center of the World's Fair was this architectural marvel called the White City, um, which is kind of the, the place where all of the different visitors would gather. Uh, and uh, it was designed with this beautiful neoclassical design as a kind of utopian city, as a kind of ideal um, city of the future. And here's, here's a picture of it um, from, from that period. Um, you, Unfortunately, the White City no longer exists anymore. You can't you can't go see it if you visit Chicago. Um, but um, the photographs of it are quite spectacular. Uh, to a young woman like Carrie, Chicago must have surely seemed like this place of opportunity and adventure. Um, she would have been only one of swarms of young single women who are arriving from the countryside to find work. Um, social reformer Jane Addams would say in 1890, just the year after Carrie arrives, never before in civilization have such numbers of young girls been suddenly released from the protection of the home and permitted to walk unattended upon the city streets and to work under alien roofs. So there's the sense of Chicago as both a city of opportunity and also of danger. And um, speaking of danger, this Chicago boom was born out of immense destruction. So in 1871, there was a huge fire that burned down um, nine square kilometers, um, 18,000 buildings, uh, 300 people were killed and 100,000 were left homeless. There are some myths about um, how the Chicago fire got started and even some songs that came out of this. And I will maybe leave some links to this in, um, in the page on Canvas. But the basic thing you need to know is the city was mostly wiped out in 1871. And the rebuilding effort presented this huge opportunity for land speculators and architects who wanted to come and basically make something out of nothing and achieve something truly remarkable and make huge amounts of money. Um, and of course, they would build out of brick and stone this time instead of out of wood, which is most of the buildings um, in Chicago before the fire were wood. 
Um, in the intervening two decades, so between 1871 and 1889, architects like Daniel Hudson Burnham and John Wellborn Root gave Chicago its really distinctive look, um, its distinction, distinctive architectural character, and um, solved also some major engineering problems that were barriers to building tall buildings on Chicago's sandy, wet soil, where buildings would tend to sink or settle after um, they had been built. The innovation of the elevator, in particular, finally made it possible to build taller buildings, since a person's ability to climb the stairs was no longer a limiting factor. Um, John Wellborn Root um, also developed a floating foundation that prevented bu these buildings from sinking into the earth, like I said, and it allowed them to keep getting taller and heavier. So in 1881, um, Burnham and Root unveiled the Montauk Building, um, which at seven stories tall um, was the tallest building in Chicago and was the first building to be called a skyscraper. Um, of course, this seems very small to us today. <laughs> um, a seven story building is not very impressive, is, is pretty mundane at this point. But at the time, uh, this was considered very tall indeed. Like you could stand at the top of this building and see views that no one had ever seen before, except for the construction workers that um, who had actually built the building. Um, and it wasn't the tallest for very long because um, subsequent innovations allowed for buildings to keep getting taller and taller and taller. So Chicago becomes the city of skyscrapers, the city of very, very tall buildings rising up um, out of the farmland, out of the prairie. Um, Chicago's other innovations, like I said, include the modernization of the shopping experience. So Marshall Fields was the kind of big department store that um, was founded in Chicago. Um, it had, that company has since been bought by Macy's um, in 2005, but um, you can still go to the original Marshall Fields store in Chicago. Um, it was not the first department store in the strictest sense of the word. It's seen Paris and London um, have examples of this type of store um, somewhat earlier, you know, the type of store where you can go in and buy anything. You know, not just clothes, not just um, jewelry, not just um, furniture, that kind of thing, but, um, but where you can come and buy, shop for everything at once. Marshall Field introduced some innovations, including kind of the modern customer service model, um, where the goal is to kind of please the customer and satisfy the customer's needs, um, and not just we have what you need and you are here to come and convince me to give it to you. Um, it also innovated things like personal shopping, um, revolving credit. It was the first department store or the first um, store period to have escalators inside. And so what we think of as the department store today um, really kind of begins with Marshall Fields in a sense. Um, so it makes the luxury buying experience more accessible and, and, and the, more, the, the shopping experience more modern. So it's building on State Street still exists, and it's considered to be one of Chicago's architectural gems. Um, in terms of other like famous companies associated with Chicago, Chicago was also the home of George Pullman, who produced a new type of luxury sleeping car that dominated American railroads in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Traveling in the Pullman car was like traveling um, first class um, today, traveling first class on an airline today. Um, the Pullman Palace car um, was this beautiful sort of drawing room car where rich people could go from their sleeping car um, to sit and congregate and play cards and have tea or have drinks or, or whatever. And you can see the this is the inside of a railroad car and it's decorated as if it's some, you know, lavish, lavish country club hall or something like that. You don't see trains like this anymore. But um, George Pullman, a major Chicagoan, um, famous for helping make the city what it was, um, and again, for introducing these elaborate luxury experiences into um, uh, Americans' lives. So the point is, is that Chicago was home to luxury, and also a lot of the new millionaires of the post-Civil um, War era. This is a, um, a, a drawing of Lakeshore Drive, which would have been the place where a lot of really wealthy people lived, and um, we'll see that there is a scene um, in Sister Carrie that takes place on, on Lakeshore Drive. Um, but as Carrie's journey shows, this kind of life just was not available to most people. So Chicago has a whole lot of wealth. It also has a whole lot of inequality. So some of the worst slums in America were located in Chicago. And most of the newcomers to Chicago were poor immigrants from places like Italy, places like Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia, um, also free um, African-Americans who were leaving the plantations they had been freed from 
um, after the Civil War um, and are looking to find some opportunity in the North, very often found very harsh conditions, poverty, discrimination, et cetera. This is actually something we'll talk about much more in the second unit of this class, the experience of African-Americans moving from um, the rural plantations to the, the major cities of America. So in the book, we know that Carrie's brother-in-law is himself one of these European immigrants, um, and he's working very hard to be able to buy his own land on the edge of Chicago. Um, Dreiser's own father was an immigrant from Germany, but they actually lived in Indiana, not Chicago. The author, like Carrie, did not come to Chicago until adulthood. So in certain ways, Dreiser was himself a little bit like Carrie. Though, though the real inspiration for this character was actually his sister, Emma, Emma Dreiser. Um, and she incidentally is, all, this is also the image from the cover of my copy of, of Sister Carrie. She's, this, this picture of Emma Dreiser is often like considered in some ways to be the image of Carrie, the inspiration for Carrie. Um, she had a kind of romantic path that's not unlike Carrie. It's, I won't give too much detail so as not to spoil the novel, um, but she's the genuine inspiration. But um, like Carrie, Dreiser arrives in Chicago as a young man and his arrival to Chicago in chapter one likely mirrors the author's um, own experience um, as he himself had this really deep sense of the possibilities it held. So arriving with only a few dollars to his name, he declared, this is paradise upon arrival. In his autobiography, this is how he remembers his arrival in Chicago. And like Carrie, he was also really attracted to the city's consumer pleasures, to clothes, to the theater, to all of the beautiful things that he saw, even though they weren't really all that accessible to him. Um, he eventually became critical enough of wealth and equality of um, American consumer culture to actually eventually become a fellow traveler of the Soviet Union and to join the Communist Party of the United States um, very, very late in his life, um, largely as a result of his experiences living in poverty um, and also his deep, his lifelong deep sympathy with people who come from his background with the poor. Um, he worked in Chicago, he worked in menial jobs at a restaurant and then at a shipping company for a few years, but then he was actually offered the opportunity through a teacher of his to attend Indiana State University. And so he went and did that and then embarked on a career as a journalist and later um, a novelist. So a little bit different from what, a lot different from what happens with Carrie, although both individuals, both Dreiser and both Carrie would visit both Chicago and, and eventually make their careers in New York. So um, in chapter one of the novel, the narrator says, when a girl leaves her home at 18, she does one of two things. Either she falls into saving hands and becomes better, or she rapidly assumes the cosmopolitan standard of virtue and becomes worse. Of an intermediate balance under the circumstances, there is no possibility. These are some of the most famous lines from this novel. So on Monday, we discussed tropes about the city and the country. And here the novel is kind of playing with those that a girl comes to the city, one of two things must happen. Either she becomes better, she's improved by it, or she is essentially becomes a fallen woman. She's seduced or corrupted in some way and um, becomes worse. So the, here's the novel is kind of playing with those tropes and suggesting that Carrie must follow one of these two paths that is established by a lot of the fiction that came before this book. So uh, what I want you to comment on in our forum discussion is, is how these early chapters set our expectations for what will happen to Carrie in this story. Um, is it gonna follow those conventional tropes? Um, do we really believe the narrator or is the narrator being ironic when it says that there's no possibility of intermediate balance or something in between? And furthermore, how do we see Carrie changing with her early experiences in Chicago? And do we think it's predominantly for the better or, or the worse? This is gonna be the subject of, of our discussion um, in the forum. So I please, please join me there. Um, and um, I hope we can have a very interesting conversation. Thank you for listening.